Tower of God is back. After four long years, our prayers have finally been answered. Well, mine more specifically, because one of the greatest series that I have ever read is here for its second season. This must be what Christmas in July feels like, or finding a curly fry in a batch of regular fries, because we actually get a continuation of this massive cliffhanger, where Rachel essentially pushed Bomb over the edge, manipulated everyone into thinking that he's dead, while Bomb drowns in a metaphorical and literal abyss of despair. Yes, if you couldn't guess, Rachel sucks and I hater. I know, crazy hot take. And now, Season 1 Tower of God is really only the prologue of this epic story, scratching the surface of this gigantic iceberg that is the tower. The purpose was simply to set the stage for Bum's journey as an irregular, and the colossal impact his existence will have as he makes his ripples. That's why in the power system, he's regarded as a wave controller. He makes the tide, and everyone else is there to ride the wave. In Season 1, many seeds were planted, and only now they will start to bear fruit as we witness what everything really means. The family leaders, the king, Jahad, and of course, the irregulars. But in this dark abyss that Bomb finds himself in, a guy named Huaryun comes to his aid. If you didn't know, she was the girl in the latex jumpsuit that Bomb destroyed in order to protect Rachel, which honestly was a pretty terrible decision in hindsight. And due to certain affiliations and plans that have been masterminded outside of the normal scope of a regular's adventure, She's here to support Bomb for her own motivations. Hawaryun tells Bomb that as an irregular, he possesses a power that anyone would love, and in the right hands, he has the potential to become a savior for the tower even a god. Most people are climbing the tower to search for answers, satisfying their dreams and desires, and they will kill and betray to meet that end, or gain the power to do so. This is the nature of the tower. This is the darkness that Bomb has experienced, and with this chip on his shoulder, he carries that burden entering the season. The tower is a system that rejects defiance and disorder, a system that kills and destroys its people, forcing them to do the unthinkable in order to climb to a higher level. As an outsider, Bomb is an entity that defies the laws of the tower, and with his own merit, he holds the key to know everything about this world and desire anything and achieve anything. All he ever wanted was to stand by Rachel's side, but now he has to figure out his purpose for himself, rediscover his identity, and gain enough power so he or anyone else close to him is never hurt again. And now after about six inverse years, we pick up exactly where we left off. We are first reintroduced to Yuri Jahad, who during this hiatus has made our way to one of Jahad's many palaces to touch base with her sister Repelista. Yuri doesn't believe that Bomb could have died. She put a lot of stock in him, and her respect in people has never disappointed her before. But on her way to Rapalista's chamber, she is stopped by another princess of Jahad and the owner of the Yellow May, Masheni Jahad. Now, Masheni plays an integral role much later in the tower, so she's kind of irrelevant now. So all you really need to know about her is that she's a baddie, and she's originally from the Kuhn family. Yuri meets up with Rapalista, who has the disposition and demeanor of your average otaku shut-in. She congratulates Yuri on acquiring two of the 13th month series weapons, a feat that hasn't been repeated since Garam Jahad. But she doesn't really care about that, she just wants to find Bomb so she gets straight to business. And so they go into discussions and eventually strike a deal. Repelista will search for Bomb, and Yuri will fulfill a favor for her. For Repelista, the tower is just a game to entertain her boredom, and with the Prince of Jahad's upcoming return, she's ready for the conflict of two different forces. This is the core of what this season is about, it's a tale of two protagonists woven together by fate, coming from two opposing backgrounds and sharing a destiny that will reshape the tower. And it all begins on the 20th floor, following our newest main character, Ja Wagnon, a person who mysteriously carries Jahad's ring. The 20th floor is an area that calls regulars. Everyone has their own ceilings when it comes to climbing the tower, and this floor is one of many that screens regulars. It's like a garbage dump for those who have given up on climbing the tower, scattered with scum who feed off the dreams of failures. Unless you pass the test and achieve the E-rank status, you can't climb higher, and Wang Nen has found himself at the rent-a-girlfriend end of that stick. Wang Nen has struggled on this floor for about a year now, left behind by his friends and accumulating a massive debt because of the excessive exam fee, so he's just trying to make it day by day. But Wang Nen is our classic optimistic shonen protagonist. He'll never give up until he reaches his dreams of becoming the king of the tower. He also has a pretty amazing moveset of throwing Walmart Pokeballs, so this guy is also on the way to becoming a true Pokemon master. Sorry, Ash. But whether it be his lack of ability or his unluck, 
Every time he takes a step towards his dream, he trips up, or in this case, gets roasted until he's a solid golden brown. Despite the odds, Wayne won't give up on his dreams. He will pursue them at all costs, regardless of the price he has to pay. Because for him, the only difference between those at the top of the tower and anyone on the 20th floor is whether you've given up climbing or not. So with his last opportunity of moving forward on the line, he enters his final test with a mindset that he will succeed. Failure is not an option. That's when he encounters the Dark Horse, a shadowy figure with long hair and dark eyes who has slayed every competitor, completely rewriting Wayne's expectations for how this test was going to go down. Just off his first impression, Wayne understands that if he tries anything, he's as good as dead. So rather than making an enemy, he chooses to form an ally of sorts to take the pacifist route. Or rather, to attach himself to someone's strong strategy so he can pass the test, which is a pretty valid way of approaching things given the situation. Wayne and rationalizes that, hey, if me and this guy team up, we can just gang up on anyone else who tries to come in our way. It's the perfect way to win. But it doesn't really go as planned. A really strong guy shows up, so it's back to plan A. Next, a little girl pops in, and feeling morally compromised, he lets it slide, only for a similar thing to happen with the next examinee. Now, you gotta realize that Wayne is absolutely shell shocked over this twist in development. The E rank exam is supposed to be brutal and deadly, and instead, it's peaceful and carefree. It's difficult to rationalize these circumstances, considering how much struggle he's experienced and the countless failures he's faced climbing the tower. The friendly undertones of these exchanges run counter to the ideology of the tower, where it's pointless to make these attachments in the first place because eventually you're just gonna cut them off. The fact of the matter is, trancing around with such a lukewarm mindset will only lead to your death your friends one day and enemies the next. That's why another name for Tower of God is the Tower of Betrayal, cause I swear there's more backbending in this than Gojo's unstoppable backshots. This is just a reminder to watch your back when you're around Gojo, he's pretty unpredictable. But then Wayne proceeds to make that little girl cry and he comes off as grade A asshole numero uno, which is, you know, pretty impressive. Good job, dude. Especially when she says that she's climbing the tower to see her parents, that just pulls on your heartstrings. So instantly, Wayne and stalks plummet. But don't worry, they're on the rise again because Silverhair walks in and makes Wayne Nen look like her local Mother Teresa or something more relevant like Kanata. Now while this mini conflict is going on, that same mysterious figure in black speaks up and makes it apparently clear that everyone here is just a burden to him. They don't matter at all. No one will pass. Everyone but him will fail. So disregard your dreams and aspirations because they're in for a rude awakening. Maintaining that lifeless deadpan expression, he comes out blasting with a full throttle assault, severely outclassing his contemporaries before him. It's a five against one and he doesn't even consider this a fight. It's no more than a chore than washing the dishes. He's gonna make them lose and move on. That's just the way it goes. And under this intense pressure, that's when they finally realize who exactly this person is. He's the Slayer candidate for the anti-Jahad faction Fug, a brutal and ruthless killer who will do anything to climb the tower and kill Jahad. Jew Viol Grace. Now the fact that a Fug member, let alone a Slayer candidate, is present on the 20th floor is a way bigger deal than you might imagine. To recruit someone with so much destructive potential as a God Slayer this early in the tower is akin to building the foundation of revolution. And as this variable that possesses seemingly limitless power, it's pretty much a guaranteed death for anyone who tries to step in his way. This was Wayne's last chance to pass the exam, but in reality, he never stood a chance from the beginning. Regardless of the odds, one thing you gotta give credit to Wayne is his indestructible will. And despite facing constant despair, he continues to fight on, vowing to climb to the top of the tower. And those words and motivation strike a chord with Viole, reminding him of memories he buried in the deepest crevices of his mind, like Rachel and the stars. That's right, this person, this overpowered force of nature, is none other than the 25th bomb. And caught off guard and losing his composure for an instant, he gets poke bombed which sends him reeling. Didn't know that Wayne had enough badges to do that. Now lucky for him, he can regenerate, so any damage he took was pretty much negated. However, it was enough to wait out the time limit so everyone was able to move on to the next test. But this battle and the choices that bomb made created this rift between between him and the other examinees, which is perhaps a good thing because they would have just been a hindrance to him. The sad reality, that kind, golden-hearted protagonist that we all know and love has turned into this a monster of chaos with 1,000 aura. A person who was so lonely and only wanted friendship now shuts down anyone who tries to come close to him. He doesn't need friends, he can't have friends, just allies that will serve his needs and get him closer to slaying Jahad. And yet, Bum understands that he's just lying to himself 
When Wayne and outstretched an open hand, all he saw was the image of Kuhn, a representation of the bonds he forfeited to get to this point. Bomb comes across as his overpowered freak of nature with an icy and uncaring disposition, the Slayer candidate, Jovial Grace. But he's still that same lonely kid stuck in that dark cave, waiting and hoping that someone can save him from the recesses of his depression.